Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is our 92nd video cast and 82nd podcast for the week ending July 23rd, 2021. Happy Friday. And uh, we'll kick it off quickly with the media, and then we want to get right down to Alibaba. That's the elephant in the room this week, so we want to address it head on. And um, so on Monday morning, I got a call from Ali Thompson over at Cheddar. The Dow was down 800 points at the time, S&P probably down 100. And um, she asked me to come on right away about uh, 15, 20 minutes later to discuss uh, the market meltdown. And so I finished up a couple buy orders and I jumped on with Brad Smith. Thanks to Ali Thompson and Brad Smith over at Cheddar for having me on. And we talked about um, really the opportunity that the market was serving up and the fact that there had been this underlying weakness for several weeks in specific sectors. The reopening trade had, had been taking a breather and the, the uh, tech had been getting a bid. And, um, you know, the one statement that I made that Brad really latched on to uh, and, and uh, found appropriate was, you know, Wall Street is the only place when they hold a clearance sale, no one shows up. And that was certainly the case. Uh, we added to BABA that day. And uh, we also uh, initiated some uh, Intel uh, in some accounts added to others. And we're going to talk about both of those names and um, a little bit about how we're thinking about things this week. So, you know, with BABA, um, you know, what I was predominantly focused on, and that's what we're going to get into now, is nothing has really changed other than the fact today we saw uh, the Chinese government take another action that was against their self-interest, which was uh, suggesting that the for-profit education schools should become non-profit. And the, the basic reason behind that is that uh, they realize they're Japan. That's basically what it comes down to. We've talked in the last few weeks, they realize they have a demographic problem from their one child policy. And um, they're not going to be able to solve it this decade. They're, they're basically, you know, maybe have a few more years and then they're going to they're going to stagnate like Japan did for two decades. Uh, but they're trying to quickly recover and now encourage not only two kids, but three kids per child. And in their mind, it wasn't the error of the policy uh, decades ago to do one child, which, by the way, they might have had to do in terms of resources and development and everything else. Uh, that wasn't the problem. The problem is, is that uh, there are tutor providers that are making the Chinese kids work too hard and causing costing the Chinese parents too much money to make sure that they do well in school. They're private providers. Some of them are publicly traded. So the Chinese government says, if we just shut them all down, that means that uh, parents will want to have kids and... Um, uh, and our problem and our demographic problem will be solved and we won't wind up like Japan. Um, that's, you know, that that's not the problem. Uh, and that's not, not the solution. And effectively, you know, if you think about if hypothetically the U.S. policy was to make sure that China stays behind, which it's not. But let's just say hypothetically it was. And we said, what could we do to make sure that China never catches up to us? The number, the, the number one thing we would do is we would say, let's, let's uh, make sure that they don't have access to our capital markets. Because if they lose access to our capital markets and we tell our institutional investors not to invest in Hong Kong, they're going to have mass unemployment. They're going to have uh, mass rioting and they're going to have an overthrow of government sooner or later once they lose, you know, a million jobs. Uh, so so that that's the first thing we would do. The second thing we would do long term is say, let's close down all their private tutors because their schools are OK. But without the extra private tutoring, there's no way their their kids will get into our U.S. universities, which are the best in the world. Uh, and they won't thrive. So let's make sure that they're at an educational disadvantage. And the number one way to do that is choke off all their access to private tutoring. Well, the the if if the government had that policy, those, those are the first two places you would strike. 
cause mass unemployment by uh, closing capital markets in the U.S. and uh, uh, limiting our institution's ability to invest in Hong Kong by saying it's an unplace, uh, unsafe place to do business uh, and uh, give them an educational disadvantage. Uh, well, the U.S. government did not do that to China. China just did it to itself. And the irony of it is, you know, I've heard of Japanese kamikaze pilots that go on suicide missions to hurt themselves. Uh, here's the definition of kam kamikaze. A Japanese pilot trained in World War II to make a suicidal crash attack, especially on a ship, an airplane loaded with explosives to be pilot piloted in a suicide attack, slang, an extremely reckless person who seems to court death. Well, these actions by the Chinese government that are completely in their intermediate term uh, um, bad, bad interest it's against their interest to do these type of things they're doing it because they think they're going to see a short-term gain and what they're going to wind up with is the exact opposite so so what what's effectively happened is um, and one of the points that I made on Bloomberg is that they've got 248 Chinese uh, publicly listed companies in the U.S. with about 2.1 trillion dollars of market cap, uh, the the government Chinese government is not going to want to destroy access to the global capital markets because it will cause mass unemployment. It will impair their domestic companies' ability to um, uh, to raise capital to to create jobs and to create innov innovation domestically, which is exactly what they need to do. Uh, particularly, they want to become self-sufficient in terms of, um, you know, producing their own semiconductors. They can't do that without the advanced machinery from Western developed nations who have to approve it. Uh, so, so then, by thinking that let's choke off education so our, our students can't compete on a global stage by cutting off uh, private providers. Now, that's not to say there aren't gunslingers in the private education business and scams and all that stuff like there was with live streaming and that they don't need regulation. They certainly do. And by the way, how it, how it was interpreted by the markets today and unconfirmed in terms of the policy that they're going to take um, uh, you know, may, may not be exactly what winds up happening, and, and it may actually be the same case in the case of Didi, uh, what ultimately find, winds up happening. The point is, we're getting to the point where uh, all of the worst case scenarios, sell the rumor, uh, are kind of in the market. So the worst case scenario would be, you know, in terms of the education providers, they shut them down completely. Well, they're not doing that. They're limiting their hours and there's rumors about what they're gonna to do to ownership structure and profitability and that type of thing. So in that case, that's a $100 billion industry. So they're basically choking off 100 billion of 2.1 trillion, assuming it goes to zero, which I think is an aggressive assumption, but that's what the market traded like today. Uh, I think erroneously, but we're, we're going to find out in coming weeks and months, or maybe it'll take a half a year for them to realize they made a huge mistake and reverse it. Uh, you know, some, some people make the best decisions after they exhaust all other possibilities. Perhaps that's the case in this instance with the regulators, but we're going to find out. Uh, my guess is this is a shoot first, ask questions later. And the worst thing you can do is give markets uncertainty. You know, GoTo is uh, one of those uh, providers and they said they didn't receive any notification from the government. Uh, TAL and EDUs uh, had no reply. So my guess is it's not good news, but it, it may not be what people are speculating about. It was all a Chinese article in Kaixan, C-A-I-X-A-N, which is a major business publication in China. You can copy and paste the, the text into Google Translate, and it basically says, says that. Um, but... You know, these are the type of things that uh, have left Europe in the dust and why Europe has no tech behemoths and or major innovation in the tech industry is because of overregulation. And China is actually at the point where not only were they taking on U.S.'s dominance, uh, but they were on track to surpass it. In the case of Alibaba, uh, Alien is growing at a faster pace than Amazon Web Service and was growing uh, about 20% 20 per, 20 uh, internationally, particularly in Asia, with their cloud business and poised to grow exceptionally far. Now, if 
the capital markets start to penalize them based on the um, mercurial behavior uh, and capricious behavior of the Chinese government, well, then they're going to set themselves back, uh, not only like Europe uh, uh, in terms of regulating themselves out of uh, business and giving U.S. total dominance in the tech world and complete not just domestic but global monopoly, uh, but at the same time um, uh, causing mass unemployment, which uh, unlike Europe, which is a democracy um, by and large, uh, in China, you know, mass unemployment is the guaranteed formula for a government overthrow over time. It's just it's just a matter of time. So you close capital markets, you destroy unemployment, you destroy employment. Uh, and uh, and it's game over. And then lastly, um, you know, they do have that demographic headwind and they are, because they've read history books, realizing that that policy is going to hurt them in the short term and they're just desperately now trying to cling as they sense the, the slowing could be coming. Uh, so uh, we'll see. So, so that's all the bad news. There, there's a lot of good news and we're gonna point to some of that as, as we go through. But, um, you know, I just wanted to, uh, you know, quickly what, cover what I covered with Brad. And that was that uh, it was difficult, despite the fact that everyone was panicking on Monday morning, it was a buying opportunity because with the Fed's balance sheet at an all-time high as of last Friday, with uh, earnings estimates were at 213. They went up again this week. I said they'd probably get to 225, 230. Uh, before the end of the year, that's 2020 earnings estimates. Uh, you know, very difficult to get too bearish. And, and we talked about some of the opportunities and what to add to and, and what initiated. And we also talked about Boeing was down quite a bit. And uh, we, we added uh, at the margins, at the margins to energy, nothing big on energy. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because that's one of the ask me anything questions. So anyway, was it, uh, and then the last thing I said is, you know, look for after 2.30, uh, margin calls, you'll probably see some buying into the close, and we certainly did. And then by Tuesday, uh, everyone was back in the market. Uh, they didn't show up to the clearance sale on Monday, but by Tuesday, and we were off to the races. So, so that was really nice to be in the middle of it. You know, looking back, you know, everyone's like, well, that was an easy call. But in the middle of it, uh, you know, no one was really having that view. And it, it was, uh, it was, uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Allie had me on, and, and Brad, uh, thanks for that. Then the next day I was on uh, Bloomberg TV with, I uh, want to thank, I was on with Heidi Stroud Watts and Sherry Ann, uh, Sherry Ann, uh, so Heidi Stroud Watts and Sherry Ann, and I want to thank Jung Su Meng and Yang Yang. Uh, Jung Su is, Jung Su Meng uh, mostly handles the TV, and then an hour later I was on radio with Kathleen Hayes and Doug Krisner. Uh, those were on at about 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. in New York, uh, New York time and uh, on the U.S. stations as well. And in both of these, we covered most of the same uh, subject matter, but with kind of different tilts. And I want to kind of go through all of it. We covered a little bit about uh, BABA and, and they asked a lot of good questions about BABA and the risks of regulation, et cetera. You know, one of the other things that has happened uh, in the last week is 33 of the top tech China tech giants have signed a voluntary self-discipline pledge last week at the China Internet Conference. So it seems like, you know, Didi got it bad for doing the IPO at the wrong time and not running things by the Chinese government during the 100 year uh, anniversary of the Communist Party. Uh, so they're now, it looks like, going to get a severe fine. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is they're going to get a severe fine and that quantifies the risk. And once the market can quantify the short-term pain, it can look through and move forward. Not dissimilar to Alibaba paying the $2.8 billion a few months back. Um, and it seems like, you know, what we found with most of the big China internet companies is that July 8th, seems to be the day that most of them hit their absolute bottom. And that was coincident with the Chinese government approving Tencent's uh, deal to buy Sogu, which was a search engine creator uh, or provider. 
uh, which was a big deal because it showed for the first time that the since Didi that the Chinese government was acting rationally on a deal by deal basis. And rather than just saying no to everything because they were big tech, they actually said yes. And, and that gave the market confidence that there's uh, some level of rationality. Some things do need to be regulated. Some things have gotten out of control, but they were going to, you know, the, their interest is in growth and their interest is in, um, uh, you know, doing the right thing. So uh, so that was a big deal July 8th. So keep your eye on that with regard to most of the larger tech companies. And then we talked about Alibaba and, and nothing has changed in the underlying business other than the noise of these marginal um, uh, basically call option uh, education providers that the Chinese government is worried about um, discouraging young couples from having children because of the costs to make sure they're properly educated because if you're not properly educated you wind up doing uh, really you know tough jobs uh, and uh, and that's that so you know probably the best solution would be for the government to pay for some of it uh, pay for some of the tutoring as an incentive uh, and sure, do you want the kids studying 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Probably not. So like some limitations on hours, like Sunday off makes sense. Uh, Saturday off, I don't know about that. Weeknights off, I don't know about that. But, you know, they'll, they'll come. It'll, the, the pendulum always swings to the extreme or the government will stand behind that and they'll, they'll have killed 100 billion of the 2.1 trillion. And then we'll see how much more of that they want to lose. It's really just going to depend on when the riots start from unemployment because these industries uh, uh, employ quite a, quite a few people and and uh, and quite a few educated people. So uh, we'll keep our eye on that. But as far as Alibaba goes, who um, they were in this same crosshairs months ago, uh, they're still trading at 17 and a half times next year's earnings, you know, some even smaller multiple if you look two three years out that multiple goes into the low single digits by the way uh versus an average uh multiple of 28 times since they ipo'd in 2014 and uh and you can buy it at uh, 2018 prices the only difference is july 2018 prices in july of 2021 difference is they've doubled revenues per share doubled earnings per share and doubled cash flow per share the other thing that uh, is something to keep in mind from 2014 to 2021, the compound annual growth rate of the top line has been 41.4%. The, the uh, compound, uh, compound annual growth rate of EBITDA has been 23.4%. And but however, enterprise value has lagged at 13.9% compound annual growth rate. So we think that gap is going to be filled once all this noise blows over. And we think that, uh, and we said on uh, Bloomberg TV and radio that we think this can get get up to $100. We think that's the current intrinsic value. If we see growth over the next couple of years, uh, which is anticipated, you know, all new highs, it could go 400. It can it can move beyond and and uh, grow. But that that's largely going to be up up to the government. I mean, Alibaba is a monster. It's a Ferrari, and the question is whether the government puts a governor on it and decides they want to be Europe and have no technological advantage. So they have to buy all their tech products from the United States uh, big players and give us that huge competitive advantage. And I'm sure uh, our uh, Silicon Valley would be happy for the Chinese government to continue to do what they're doing. Uh, or they can say, no, we have a shot to be a global leader and dominate. Uh, we're going to champion our, our big players like Alibaba and JD and Tencent and some of the others and, uh, and grow in Asia, grow in Europe and, and try to compete in the US. And those things uh, we're going to find out are uh, whether they're part of the plan in short order. But when you consider the discount to intrinsic value, the discount to historical multiples, it's all attributable to this recent behavior of the government. And as that works itself out, we, you know, it, it feels like today was really the acute phase of this. Uh, everything that was feared, uh, you know, for some of these smaller sectors came to pass. And now it's like the Band-Aid is off. Now what? And, and, and now what is, I think, uh, what you're going to see is surprisingly also Alibaba held up relatively strong today, which was very interesting to see. And we'll take a look at the charts and some of the things that we're looking at in that uh, standpoint. 
Um, the second pick we talked about on uh, Bloomberg Radio and TV was uh, Boeing. You know, never-ending problems with Boeing, not nonstop bad news. First, it was the 737 Max. Then it, now it's the 787. Uh, that's the bad news. But the good news is they booked 219 orders in June. There's still a duopoly with Airbus. And a, a big catalyst is going to be approval of the 737 MAX in China. That's the, the fastest seller there. Uh, and China is one of the only countries that haven't uh, authorized it yet since they had their problems. This is all part of a negotiation, which we're going to talk about. Um, the um, We have a big delegation meeting um Let's see here. We have Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman is meeting with China's. So she's our number two diplomat is meeting with China's number two diplomat. If you recall a few weeks ago in uh, they were supposed to meet in Alaska and then China said, no, we'll give you our number five guy. And we're just like, "Okay, no meeting game over. And now China came back to the table and said, "Okay, we'll send our number two guy. So this is going to be a high level meeting on the 25th. It's showing that both sides realize that progress needs to be made. And, um, you know, and China's basically saying, um, as far as uh, John Kerry's out there urging China to help break this, this climate suicide pact, and China's responding by saying cooperation is linked to wider issues. So China wants some stuff from the U.S. The U.S. wants some stuff from China. We want the Boeing uh, approved, which is going to be great for them. It's going to be great for us. Uh, you know, we want some climate concessions. Uh, so there's a whole thing uh, related to that. And I'm sure there'll be talk of uh, uh, public listings. Uh, I can imagine the amount of lobbyists that are outside uh, uh, the White House or outside Congress from Wall Street saying, you know, get these listings back on track with China. This is not going to help us. Uh, this is a huge part of our business. So you know, th this has come to a head right now. I think a lot of what was feared is is here. And now, uh, you know, there's there's not much more bad news leakage. It might get a little bumpy in terms of getting through some negotiations and cooperation. But ultimately, nothing has changed for the underlying business of Alibaba uh, in terms of growth, in terms of uh, everything that they're doing. Now the market just needs to feel comfortable that they can realize the intrinsic value because the playing field is going to be more steady. And that's just, we're going to find out in a matter of days. The best thing that could happen would be on Monday morning, you know, Didi gets fined, you know, a couple billion, uh, I don't know, they're not that big, but, you know, $500 million. And they say, you know, you're going to be on probation for three months if you follow all of our rules, data and otherwise then we'll uh, allow you to start to accept new uh, app downloads. And you get a headline like that and the whole entire, you know, it would be the short squeeze of all short squeezes and it'll be game back on. Um, as far as the Chinese education stocks, I mean, you know, uh, all we need to know is what, 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 is the actual rules. I mean, are they going to just nationalize them? Okay, that's that's what they traded like today. Or are they going to, you know, say you can only operate, you know, 20 hours a week, you can only charge this much. And, you know, they're all down 90, 95% in the last 12 months. So, um, you know, a lot of that's priced in. So I think if, if, if they said you can only operate five hours a week, and, uh, you know, we'll leave you alone. Uh, the stocks would probably double. They're down so much. So um, so we'll see that. And then the third pick was uh, Intel. Obviously, the big news with Intel was that they were looking to buy Global Foundries. Now the CEO is saying no comment. The CEO of Global Foundries is saying, uh, you know, no, we're still on track with our plan. My guess is something will get done there, uh, maybe not right away. Right now, it looks like it's off the table, but that could be a big thing for Intel and for Global Foundries. But in the meantime, Intel still has the lion's share of the PC server and processor markets, um, and the server processor sales are going to drive growth. They beat on the top and bottom line. They got it down on margins in the short term. The market didn't like that, but there were... Um, some mixed responses. Uh, Morgan Stanley actually came out pretty bullish after those earnings. We happen to agree. Does it get a little weaker before it recovers? Maybe. But um, we do want to have some semiconductor exposure. 
uh, but we still have to find where where is their where is their value. Something that we can look at 24 months from now is you know an 80 90 dollar stock, uh, you know minimum 75, and we think Intel fits the bill. So if we get a little short term weakness, we we think it's an opportunity. As far as some of our longer term things, um, okay, how did we get here? Okay, so that was the Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg Radio. Uh, so thanks to Kathleen Hayes, Doug Krasner, Heidi Stroud Watts, and Sherry Ann, as well as Jung Su Mang and Yang Yang for having me on. And then want to thank Devik Jain and Sriyashi Senyal. Uh, I was in their article uh, this week where they were talking about the infrastructure package, and I was saying that you know the country desperately needs proper infrastructure and if they can get it passed it'd be helpful to the cyclical trade that's taken a breather in the last month and a half um, um okay so stanley druckenmiller was out basically it's looking like about 5.5 trillion dollars of additional government spending appears uh, pretty likely to get dropped on a already hot economy, okay, before the end of the year through reconciliation. And apparently Druckenmiller was out spending time this week with senators to warn them against, you know, pouring more gas on the fire. Um, and that by passing these two spending bills, um, you know, two thirds are being spent with the kind of heading or title crisis funds but the crisis is in the rearview mirror largely um and it's coming after the economy is already recovering so he's he's basically saying number one you're going to get bubbles and you're going to get inflation and with which both leads lead inevitably to, to large declines and then after it wears off and you get the decline uh you're not going to have any ammunition to solve the problem so um you know, 5.5 trillion after the fact, effectively, you know, that one point, that initial 1.9 trillion cares is all we needed to, you know, we stabilized the credit markets, the Fed did, we had the PPP program. And basically, by the time that was run off, that that additional bill they did early this year uh, with the new administration, I'm, you know, it it's getting to be like banana republic type stuff. And I think those are the fears. So while in the short term, rates are lower, dollars strong, Etc. Uh, I think, you know, in line with what we've been saying towards the end of the year, I think you start to see the 10 year yield, you know, edge back up closer to 2%. Uh, and will be the taper will be closer. It'll be a 2022 event. Uh, but, um, you know, the market is going to start to sniff that out and, and things like this, all the additional spending that wants to be done and very very small part part of it is true infrastructure roading roads buildings internet uh things we need for the for the next generation uh are you know fixed assets are not really part of it so uh i think truck and miller's right to really raise the red flags um at the at this point in time um and then you know lastly well the earnings outlook we've covered quite a bit um I think the major risk for the big players, Baidu, Baba, Tencent, et cetera, are, are likely in the rearview mirror. And for the Chinese government thinking, well, if they delist in the U.S., all the institutions will just go to Hong Kong. That may not be the case because the U.S. government's warning uh, U.S. business against doing business in Hong Kong and saying it's not a safe thing. So this is all part of the posturing, part of the negotiation. Maybe we'll get a minor breakthrough next week when, when the two number twos meet. Um, maybe the Chinese government over the weekend will realize the knock on effects of the path that they're headed down will lead to them being closed off from all capital markets globally. Uh, and it will lead to mass unemployment and an absolute overthrow of government in probably record time. Um, maybe they haven't thought that through yet. Uh, and, uh, and the weekend will give them, give them some time to do that. But in the meantime, they're taking actions that are, uh, definitely not in their interest, and it just creates the opportunity for competitors to start to you know rise more quickly um, and um, and set them back. So we're betting that 
you know, most people don't continue to do things that are against their own interest for extended period of times with before reversing course. And we're seeing them do that in terms of their one child policy. We'll see if they do that as it relates to their huge competitive advantage players uh, that could make them, you know, globally dominant, or they could become by like Europe, regulate themselves away and, and remain in obscurity um, like Japan did for the last three decades. So uh, that's that. And then um, contrarian views they asked me for. I think defensives are actually going to continue to make sense for the next couple of months, despite everyone getting re-excited about the cyclical trade for the last couple of days. And there was actually a great note by Steve Goldstein over at um, Market Watch. He was quoting Michael Hartnett. And may maybe you don't recognize the name, but Michael Hartnett is the guy who produces the Bank of America Global Fund Manager survey every month, which we produce a summary of. It's one of the most important documents I look at. <laughs> and he outlines three distinct phases to describe the market action over the last eight months. And the first phase, he says, started on November 3rd with the election and the reports of the vaccine, the new vaccine boosted stocks and credit, steepened the yield curve, weakened the dollar, and led to cyclicals outperforming defensives. And that's certainly the case. Energy and financials outperformed everything up until, um, and still year to date this year, but uh, tech is catching up. But by huge margin in, in Q4 and Q1, Q4 of last year and Q1 of this year. Then the next phase was on uh, February 16th by blowout U.S. retail sales that led to Commodities rising, yields surging, cracks in the technology sector, and uh, value stocks outperforming growth. And the third phase is what he calls peak growth slash policies that started on June 16th by the Federal Reserve, as well as uh, easing signs from China. So if you remember, China had been tightening six months ago. I was on CGTN saying this is going to bite them in the butt down the road. Well, it did. They reversed course, which is an important thing to note that their government tends to reverse course when they realize they've made an error. They did that uh, by cutting reserve requirements in the past uh, week or so. And um, in this phase for the U.S., Michael says, that led to a yield curve collapse. Uh, not a yield curve collapse, by the way. And we're going to actually just look at it. I, I think that's a, that's a strong term. Certainly the 10-year yield compressed, but the short end of the curve is still at basically zero. So what they refer to as a yield curve collapse actually looks like this and this is not a collapse this is what happens every single cycle from inversion down here inversion down here inversion out here to peak and then you get a correction and a sideways move for a year or two you get this first sharp correction and then a sideways move before the before the curve really starts to flat and here's our first correction so um uh certainly that had an impact and then uh, going back to hartnett so so what to do now? He says, own defensive quality in the second half as it's both a hedge against peak policy and peak profits. He advises going long defensives in what he calls vaccinated markets of the US and Europe and long cyclicals and reopening plays in markets with vaccine upside like Japan and emerging markets. So I think that's pretty nuanced. But um, I, I where I differ from Hartnett is I do think defensives are going to work well in this time of year for the next month, two months, maybe a little bit more, two and a half, maybe through the end of the year. But I but I also think the cyclical trade is going to come roaring back before the end of the year. And whether that's a mid to late Q3 start uh, or or certainly by Q4, but I think it's going to finish the year exceptionally strong. So uh, that that's where we differ. And uh, that's what we're trying to to balance. Now, um, let me just see if there's anything else we missed here. Oh, and then this is interesting. This just came up on my Google feed. Uh, it was an article I was Bloomberg quoted me in a couple weeks ago that uh, wasn't written by anyone. I guess they were referring to one of my notes or my podcast. It said, some investors see China's moves as counterproductive. Tom Hayes, chairman of Great Hill Capital, said Beijing was hurting itself by restricting their best companies from raising capital abroad, but Chinese government sees it the other way around. Rather than hurting the economy, the tighter oversight will prevent tech companies from growing too big and ultimately posing systemic risks to both uh, domestic and global economy. Tech companies, you know, this, these are not banks. I mean, they don't 
pose systemic risk. The question is how much of global share do they gain? And the activity that Japan uh, that China is taking, soon to be Japan if they don't change their policy, is basically guaranteeing that our dominant tech players will get all the business and they'll they'll eventually uh, wither into obscurity and wind up like Europe with no tech juggernauts. And um, and if that's what they want to do, Silicon Valley will be happy to take the win. Um, but my guess is once, you know, the first few hundred thousand people start, you know, um, picketing on the street that have no jobs or the government has to support them um, or you get some type of Tiananmen Square type event, then they'll say, wait a second, those tech companies were good. They employed a lot of smart people. They created high wage jobs. Uh, they gave us global dominance and uh, influence and power. Uh, and we kind of, you know, just shot ourselves in the foot again you know this is kind of the first example of where you're seeing a chinese kamikaze versus a japanese kamikaze but um hopefully they'll reverse course be before they have any major accidents um all right so leaving that all aside um let's get through some of the earnings this week because it's been a busy week Netflix, people were upset that they lost 500,000 subscribers in North America. They lost 500,000 subscribers because they had no content. I mean, there's literally nothing on Netflix right now. And that's going to change very, very quickly in the second half. They have all this backed up slate of content that they're going to throw on us. And by the way, for the same money, they're going to give people online mobile gaming. A lot of people like that uh, at no additional cost. So that should be helpful. But uh, it's it's uh, it's clear that obviously there's more competition competing for the same dollars in terms of Disney Plus, in terms of HBO Max, in terms of all the other services that are out there. <laughs> but what they where they do have a moat is internationally and their growth has been phenomenal. And they added net uh, 1.5 million subscribers and beat on the top line. So I think Netflix is going to be OK. I think they just have to digest this period and obviously last year when the world was shut down, they got a tremendous amount of sub ads in the US and Canada. Now that it's summertime and everyone wants to go out and there's no content, uh, I'm surprised they didn't lose more than 500,000 uh, domestically. And in most of the rest of the world that it's still less opened and less vaccinated, they're, they're continuing to do well and they have a lot less competition in those markets as well. So something to keep an eye on. Um, as far as some of the, uh, drug stocks, um, Novartis beat and um, both Novartis uh, and Pfizer's uh, providing another 200 million vaccine doses to our government for the fall, which is code for that's that's the booster shots, basically, because there aren't 200 million people who have not been vaccinated. So why would they order 200 million? It's because we're going to need a, a, another, you know, it's probably going to be an annual thing. And they've said as much as analyst at analyst meetings, and they see this as a monster revenue and profit stream, because not only will they be doing it on an annual basis, but they will be doing it at much higher margin and pricing. Uh, and um, if you recall last week, we covered that a cup and handle was setting up for all those uh, breakout type people that listen in. Uh, and that started to break out this week. So that was good. Novartis uh, crushed it in line with our original thesis that when people get back to the doctor and a lot of in-person administration and pent up demand, and uh, they beat on both top line, bottom line, and guidance. And this is also forming that same cup and handle and will also uh, break out like Pfizer starting to do as well. So that was very good to see. Now, I want to quickly shift gears to the ask me anything part of the uh, call because we've got a lot of good questions. Um, okay, Ben, first name only, please. Hey, Tom, podcast, podcast questions, please. What are your latest thoughts uh, short term on DFEN and REITs. I know you like Intel, but I'm more interested in the sector as a whole. Uh, as far as the, okay, so I'm not sure. I guess he's asking about semiconductors. Um, as far as semiconductors, I'm agnostic. Do, I think they work their way higher over the next 12 months, but I have no view short term. As far as defense and aerospace, I like it intermediate term. I don't, I don't know, and I don't care what it does in the next few weeks. So um, I just use any weakness to add to defense and aerospace, and you could add to discrete names. So yeah, it had this huge bounce off Monday. 
I think this is just going to work higher over time with with their constant pullbacks every few months. I mean, so uh, I wouldn't get too cute about that, but certainly a nice bounce back. Uh, REITs, on the other hand, um, you know, I was I was looking at REITs. It's funny this question came in because I think enough of I think there are some of these that are ready to take a breather. Um, or, or at least looking extended. So, where did I put those? Um, oh, maybe they're here. Okay, so here are some REITs. These, these are weekly charts. I, I think they're looking extended here. And, you know, as we get through earnings and we move closer toward Jackson Hole, everyone is pretty committed to the idea that they're going to announce tapering in Jackson Hole. I'm not sure that's going to happen because... I mean, maybe they announced it and it's a 2022 event, but um, maybe they also punted to October. But anyway, the market seems convinced. And if that's the case, uh, you probably start to see the 10-year yield. And as a matter of fact, the 10-year yield bounced. Um, it bounced this week off of its lows. It got down to 110. I think it closed the week about 130. And in that type of environment, I think some of these extended REITs would start to see a little bit of pressure. So uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'd be a net seller versus a net buyer. I'm not saying go short REITs or I'm, I'm just saying I, I don't buy things that are up like this. I, I would not be a buyer here. And if I had massive profits in REITs, I'd, I'd probably shave a little bit off and wait for a pullback to add back uh, to kind of trade around a position. But I, I, I don't like the risk reward here is the answer to the question as it relates to REITs. Uh, so it looks, oh, and do you think energy and banks will take another leg down below Monday's lows? Um, that's a good question. I, um, you know, I added at the margins to energy on Monday because it was just such a violent flush. You can see it started to bounce back here. This is a weekly chart. So it closed the week green after that huge flush. Um, you know, if you have no energy exposure, I don't know what I would do here, but I mean, uh, some of these on a discrete basis, it, you know, was this enough pain for all the Johnny come lately's that got excited in March and April after the thing was up a hundred, 150%. It might be because a lot of those people are leveraged. I think you got to take it on a case by case basis. Like Schlumberger had good earnings. Um, obviously long term. I mean, what's the difference if you bought Suncor at 20 and it went to 18 and then two years from now it's at 30? Like, so I, I wouldn't get too cute with it. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I don't like the risk reward for building a brand new position with them up these hot, this high, but on a discrete basis, on a one-off basis, I would look at individual companies and, and be looking for opportunity over the next two months in both banks and energy for the long term. Um, so that's the energy. And let's take a look at the banks. Um, banks had good earnings. I mean, the one that I would be like probably a new buyer of if I had no bank exposure would be Citi. Um, because you know, maybe maybe City's downside is 60 at the most, but it's gonna work its way well higher over time. Uh, but again, I, I don't love the risk reward with these things up hundred percent. This is like yesterday's news. Do we still hold a lot for the long term? Absolutely. Uh, but we trimmed a bunch, you know, early June or whenever it was, seven, seven weeks ago, six, seven weeks ago, and we still have hold our core positions, but we're not like trying to fill that last 25% uh right away i mean they're they're just better things to do and it's it, what's interesting is like everyone's looking at the things that are already up like what no one wants the things that are down like so and by the way it was the same thing last year uh as painful as as it feels like with baba um it was more painful holding wells and exxon and all those things in the fall before they finally turned and we're going to actually go into that in pretty good detail on this call. So let's get some of these closed because we, we've just had so much to cover. The other thing, so here's uh, China's online retail sales hit $1.8 trillion RMB. Uh, this was out today, increased 10.9% year on year. Who do you think has the lion's share of that is Alibaba. So the, the point that I'm making is that the underlying business continues to grow. 
We just don't know when the noise is going to clear so it can trade back to its intrinsic value and a normalized multiple based on the growth that it's experiencing. Um, so this was uh, People's Daily reported. The figure represents roughly a quarter of the country's overall consumer retail sales. Live streaming sales reached uh, RMB 388 million by the end of, of December, more than doubling from March 2020. So, you know, um, businesses, you know, if you were buying this as a private business, you would have to pay much more than what it was at its peak here at 318. So let's say if Baba was not a publicly traded company, you would probably have to buy it for 25% higher than its peak in November of 2020. You'd probably have to pay them $400 a share to take it private, just based on the intrinsic growth. And yet, this is what it trades like. So I'm not a big technical guy. I know all of it, but you know, the only way to build positions and make a lot of money is to know what you own. You have to know the fundamental backdrop. And then the technicals is just like, it's it can be helpful, but and the main time to use technicals is when the fundamentals aren't syncing up because there's some exogenous noise going out. So today I drew this out and I thought it was pretty interesting. And interestingly enough, if you remember that day, July, whatever it was, 8th, I said was the bottom. And then they announced uh, they were going to approve the Sogu deal. So Baba put in the bottom here at 199. I think it actually went down to 198 intraday, but I guess that was the closing low that they're showing here. And today it closed at 206.50. It actually held up pretty good considering the wholesale selling because you got to imagine that, you know, it's the, the top weighted holding in all of the ETFs and most Americans have their China exposure through ETFs and they were all just puking it out because of the education stock headline, which is less than 5% of the total amount of Chinese companies in the US. But, you know, people shoot first, emotional questions, retail traders. So anyway, it, it is what it is. But what was interesting about this is this is called a descending triangle, which is, you know, anyone can draw lines on the chart. But the point is that the basis of a descending chart is that when it breaks out of this descending triangle and gets above this line, sometimes it could go down, you know, below here again, who knows. Um, but when it finally breaks out, you're supposed to add the width of the uh, wide part of the triangle above the breakout point, which is $91 wide, which would imply a $311 target, which is interesting because what I've been talking about on some of my spots is that we believe the intermediate term, you know, 12 to 24 month intrinsic value is around $300, if not more. We think long term, it could be four, 600. It could be a thousand dollar stock, you know, five or 10 years out. But, um, but what the, what's interesting is this technical indicator that a lot of people look at is pointing to the same destination that we're getting to with our fundamental analysis. And, and our fundamental analysis, we think, is conservative. It's just going to be a question of how quickly the noise clears. And given how pronounced and acute it's been in the last couple of weeks, it may be sooner than we think because it's just like at that point where people are just puking out to indiscriminately and um, there's kind of a, a panic a, – mania panic in the market around Chinese names. So we, we might be closer than we think. But that's where I would get to. And of course, anything can happen. Do your own homework. I manage risk by size. If this went to zero, would it be hard to have a, a good performing year? Yes. But could I still pull it off? Absolutely. Okay. So it is a big position. But um, but if it went to zero, uh, you, no one's carrying me out in a stretcher. I have other positions that could outperform into end of year and still have a great year. So, um, so, so that's that's how I think about it. You have to, you know, consult with your financial advisor. Click on terms on hedgefundtips.com, uh, and and do what you think is best for you. But yeah, I, I could totally and that and that's by the way, how you know when you can live with the worst case scenario, then then you then like all the noise just clears away. And you can deal with the facts and you can deal with the fundamentals and you can deal with the fact that the underlying business has become more valuable since this November 2000 peak. If I had to buy this privately and LBO it, 
I'd have to pay well more than $318. I guarantee you this wouldn't be done for anything less than four or $500. So why is it trading here? Because of Mr. Market. It gets manic depressive and it overshoots on the upside and it'll probably over, relative to its fundamentals in November of 2020, it overshot to the upside and relative to its fundamentals in uh, July of 2021, it's overshooting to the downside. So the market serves up price and you get to d decide if you're a taker or you keep your, you keep your uh, bat on your shoulder and wait for the fat pitch and uh and we think this this is fat pitch which is why we've been net net adders and we've got a basis below 210 dollars um you know so 219 209 14 it's at two so, so we're two and a half dollars negative uh but we've got an incredible uh stakehold in one of the highest quality quality businesses in the world and only their government can destroy it and and they would have to work full time to do so and that would just uh, hand global economic hegemony for the next century to the United States on a silver platter if the Chinese government did that, which I don't think they want to do. So uh, we'll see what they do. Um, okay, so that is Ben's question. Um, then uh, John Croner, uh, our friend that owns all the newspapers, said, uh, Tom, thank you again for all the great info. Uh, not advice see terms <laughs> exactly can you clarify las vegas sands please i believe you said they no longer have an interest in las vegas nevada and are focused on asia now this um da -da -da -da. okay so uh you're right and you're right uh, basically they announced a deal to sell off their las vegas operations and the venetian um but the reason there's still U.S. earnings in there um, or Las Vegas is impacting their earnings is because the deal doesn't close until Q4. Okay, so that's fundamentally what you're seeing. And they're not pulling out of the U.S. They're trying to get business in Texas. They're trying to do online gaming. They're trying to open in New York and in different regions around the, uh, around the country. Um, maybe they'll even go back to Vegas. I don't know. I I think it was probably a dumb deal to sell off at the time that they did and at the price they did, such a valuable property. But, you know, people make emotional decisions. My guess is Sheldon Adelson would not have done that. Um, but if they want to make the case that all of their, you know, the vast majority of their growth and profitability comes from Macau and they should be investing there, uh, you know, I, I agree with them that that's for sure. Um, but uh, I, I wouldn't have sold the Venetian, not at that time. I mean, I, I would sell it, you know, three years out when everything's humming again. And, you know, uh, but they, they did it. And, um, you know, we, we think they will score in what they're doing. And um, uh, that answers your question. So, that, so they're going to, that's no longer going to show up after Q4 earnings. And that's why you're seeing the impact in the short term. That's residual. Uh, ben asked, what are your thoughts on semis? Again, agnostic on the sector. I think it works higher over the next year and a half. Short term, I have no idea. But my exposure, I would be buying Intel on weakness over the next month or two. And then a year or two years out, you got a probably $75 low end and maybe as high as $90, you know, two to three years out. Plus, you've got, you know, trading at 11.7 times next year's earnings or 11.5 over the last... 15 years, the average multiple has been 15. It's uh, two two and a half percent dividend yield relative to the 10 year, which is at 130. And it's raised the dividend pretty much every single year. So it's a dividend grower on top of it. I think that's a, that's a great way to get exposure. And that's why we like it. Um, okay, Daniel E asks, uh, Tom, how do you think about holding periods? Do you target multi-weeks, months, or year hold periods when you invest? Um, it depends on the stock, but by and large, if I'm going to build size, I'm thinking about it in terms of 12 to 24 months, and then often it works out faster than expected, but that's kind of like how I have to think about it in terms of you know, putting meaningful size into it. But I know before I get in where fair value is that I want to get out, and sometimes that'll happen much sooner in three to six months, but often it takes nine to 12 to 18 months. And that's, that's perfectly okay too. And if it goes against me in the short term, I know what I own. And rather than panic out and puke, which is why people blow up their accounts because they don't know what they own. They know the price of everything and the value of nothing. We use those opportunities to add more and build a, a low basis, which is what we've done in um, Alibaba. So uh, that's that. 
Um, okay. Uh, hi, Tom. This is from Dan E., I guess, again. Uh, how do you manage cash in the portfolio? I realize cash management is a critical part of investing. Without cash on hand, you may not be able to take advantage of opportunities at the same time. Uh, having that cash drag that can make a huge difference in, in returns over time. Have you considered... Uh, okay, so first question, how do you manage... Uh, when you're managing outside money, um, um, especially in this type of environment, no one is accepting of you holding cash. So basically what you have to think about is... Um, one, you're you're going to be in many stocks. So when you need cash to take advantage of Chinese stock opportunity, you're you know you may have tech stocks that have run up huge that you just take profits on. To you know, it's kind of like rebalancing. You're selling what's at or near the fair value you anticipated, and then you're putting it in today's laggards that are going to be tomorrow's leaders. So you're just constantly on that kind of hamster wheel where you're selling when the hamster's at top, to buy when the hamster's at the bottom, different sectors, different stocks. And that's really the way you manage cash. From time to time, you, you can build cash reserves, but by and large, outside clients don't want any of their money in cash. Um, they want it always earning all the time, and, um, and that makes perfect sense. Um, and then second, have you considered setting up a long-only mutual fund or ETF for retail? Um, I... I, I won't I won't rule it out, um, but I'm happy doing what I'm doing, number one. And number two, uh, one of the ways that I'm able to generate alpha for my clients is periodically expressing or enhancing ideas with derivative exposure or some portion thereof, which you can't necessarily do in those type of wrappers, uh, number one. And number two... Um, I, I don't think people should be compensated for for watching money. You know, I, you know, the idea of a management fee to me was always kind of foreign that you should get paid just for having money. Uh, I only I, I don't take a management fee. I only get paid. Uh, I eat what I kill. So, um, you know, I, I get a performance fee based on the gains that I make for the client. And, uh, and I don't get paid again until I make that back and then I make ab above that watermark uh, at every new period. So um, I found that that's a fairer deal for clients and, and it's a fairer deal for everyone because um, I only get paid when I make my client money and they make a lot more money than I make or I don't get paid. So the idea of a mutual fund or a retail fund for just collecting assets um, you know, I, I I would never rule it out, but um, I, I I don't think it's I don't think it's a, the fairest deal for the client. You know, if you consider, you know, most most kind of setups are um, where the offerer of services will charge a hundred basis points, you know, or a point. I'm not saying. ETFs necessarily are a point, but a lot of the active ones are 75, 75 basis to, to 100 basis points. So if you think about like a 7% return, you know, um, because most of them are going to average around the general market returns, most of them are closet indexing, um, they're taking 14% of the profits for generating beta. Um, and that's, that's, not a, that's not a great deal. So... Um, you know, most people don't think about it that way. They say, oh, I just pay a small fee. But that small fee, if your return is 6 or 7%, it's, you know, 14 to 20%. It's like, it's basically like paying for a hedge fund and getting a, a, uh, an index return, which no one will do uh, for, for a long period of time. So that, that's why I don't really like how the uh, mutual fund and e ETF is set up. Um, I think you've got to earn your performance and your client has to make a whole lot more than you do and in that case they'll they'll be happy and 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 you do that over time and you do it with the right partners that you both have similar philosophies um of how you think about you know wealth creation and holding periods etc so um so great question on that front and let's move right along um for those of you on the podcast we're going to get cut off in a minute uh, just go to hedgefundtips.com 
and click on, uh, you'll see the video cast, fast forward to minute 60 and you'll get the last 10 or 15 minutes. We still have a decent amount to cover because there's so much that happened with this China stuff this week that I wanted to address it head on and we had a lot of good questions. Now, as far as the general market, the ECB said they're going to keep their policy looser for longer. They've got to hit that inflation target in the market like that. Uh, Jay Powell, while he enjoys support for reappoint reappointment, it's not a lock. You can see in this Wall Street Journal article. So like I said months ago, his incentive is pedal to the metal. Um, and uh, so we covered that. And then... This is clever. This was an article in Bloomberg. Top China fund manager bets on tech as Beijing tightens grip. And what I like to see about this is this is a kind of an established manager. He's raising money to do a China tech fund. And his pitch is, um, you know, with tech giants 30% off their highs, this, there's never been a better time. And this is a guy with feet on the ground, government contacts, etc., raising money. And obviously, the best time to invest in the irony is when it's the best time to invest in something, it's the hardest time to raise money to invest in that thing. Uh, and, and that's just the irony of the business. So if you have an idea to raise a fund and no one wants to give you money, it's probably the time to be investing in that thing. So like if I went out and said, hey, we're going to do a China fund you know, after today, no one would want to give you money. And that's the exact time when you're going to make the most money investing in that particular thing. It would be like me going out last year and saying, you know, we're going to buy big banks. Look, Wells Fargo's down 55%. Exxon's down 50%. You know, could you imagine with all the green and clean and all the stuff that was going on last year, if you said you're going to raise a fund to buy oil stocks and then, you know, six months later, they're all up 100, 150%. So uh, this was nice to see someone with uh, long-term boots on the ground and probably a lot of government contacts and knows what's what. So, um, okay. Uh Okay, so this was the headline. China considers turning tutoring companies into nonprofits. Now, this is another issue uh, that we saw. Huawei is hiring former Democratic super lobbyist Tony Podesta to lobby for them. So this is going to be another thing that could potentially loosen up the friction between U.S. and China, between the capital markets, help China, help the banks, help, help potentially help Huawei, help tech. Etc. So, so there are a lot of things going on behind the surface that uh, may get this uh, kind of juggernaut uh, or uh, uh, unlocked, so to speak. And then this is an article: China's births may drop again this year from 2020 low. So China's got a real problem. Uh, they are they are doing everything humanly possible to avoid becoming Japan, uh, and uh, it's going to take time you know, and, and they're going to have to put real incentives. But the number one incentive is have great high paying jobs. And there are only, you know, 10 or 20 major companies that are providing them. And you got to let them flourish if you want people to be excited about having kids. Um, okay, now here's an, another headline. U.S. China trade booms as if virus tariffs never happen. So while all the noise is going bad, like we said, the underlying business is still there, both in tech and both in trade. So we just got to iron out some of these wrinkles. And then um, we covered all of that. Oh, this is interesting. This was from the October Cobra Kai sweep the leg market. And, you know, you look at the Baba chart and you remember they did the sweep the leg and we said, you know, maybe this is it. And then we, you know, we rallied back up to 216 and now we've been in this sideways chop and this correction. Um, it'd be interesting to see if it's, if that's the sweep, just like we had and if you look at the timing, this has been like, let's see, seven months, about eight months since the peak that Bob has just been in this kind of downtrend, building this descending channel. We finally got the leg sweep. Um, Wells Fargo is exactly the same. And I remember the pain of this leg sweep when I put out this article that, you know, we were adding and, you know, we were excited. And it was the same negative sentiment. Everyone on air was like down on the banks. DeFi is going to change the world overnight. It wasn't going to happen over five to 10 years. It was going to happen in six months. We don't need banks anymore. We got Bitcoin and all this nonsense, which may work out to be true over 10 or 20 years. But um, and just like, you know, being carbon neutral, but it doesn't happen overnight. And um, just like people didn't get off of cigarettes overnight and cigarette stocks have been the best stocks, uh, great stocks for the last 20 years, as will big oil companies over the next probably 10 years. 
so as they get regulated and um, and, and gain more share and all, all the things we've talked about in past calls. So this was exactly the same scenario. And just to pull up that chart we've been bringing out, and, and the reason we're focused on some of these technicals and sentiment is when the fundamentals don't make sense in the short term because there's too much noise. We know the fundamentals of the business are getting better, and yet price is not reflecting it because of all the noise. And this was kind of that leg sweep to aversion and then look what happened that was the leg sweep and by the way it actually got a little bit lower that, that we put out the article at 2022 and then it got down to 2056 intraday and that's after it doubled it really just needed to take out all these people with their stop loss orders because they don't know what they own and they don't have a historical context that wells fargo's only traded at, at uh 50 percent discount to book two other times in his career recovered within months not years and that's exactly what happened and uh was up 150 percent over the next six months once it turns but this is the painful process this was uh you know basically 11 months or so you know you, the crash and then you had another what did you have march to november so another eight months so what have we had we had the crash and then we've basically been going like this for another eight months we had the leg sweep now we will see if this level of sentiment holds up okay so this was the returning confidence enthusiasm then you have the first flush then you have the rollover now you're in discouragement up to anxiety and then we were thinking this was aversion or it could be down here in discouragement and then you push up to anxiety would be 273 a pullback and then straight back up and we get up to that 310 which is which is what it's kind of looking like here is where you have this flush you have this move back up and then you just have these non-stop you know three type of bottoms one two and three Again, none of this is perfect, and anyone who thinks it's formulaic, which is why we don't use a lot of technical analysis, but we're trying to make sense of just a incredible opportunistic situation we think can play out. And then when no one's believing, and you get these type of, you get that leg flush here, and then you get a couple of these bumps, thinking people thinking it's going to go back down, maybe that's what we got here. And then you start to work your way back up to here. And that's where you hit some resistance and then they drop you back before taking it up to new highs. We'll, we'll see how it works out, but it is playing kind of according to script and that would be in line with some of these other things that we're talking about. Um, and that's what happened last year when we went through the exact same pain and everyone kept saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, this is what we're doing. And that's exactly what we did. So let's see. So that was REITs. We covered that. Um, go through a couple of these just to give you an idea of the general market the one that really stands out to me okay cumulative volume ratio this is you know towards where you'd see bounces versus uh wanting to sell same thing with this high low um the one thing that really materials are looking beaten down there may be some opportunity there which tells me that the cyclical trade how long will it take for this to bottom before the cyclical trade comes back we'll see we think we're going to have time to get exposure there um again another this looks closer to a buy than a sell but the one i wanted to show you was this pmo buy all this got down to zero this week near all-time highs uh percent on a pmo crossover buy signal all you need to know is that you got higher odds that you're close to a bottom when this is at zero and oftentimes it's a great place to load up and that's where we hit earlier this week and now we're working off of it when you're at 100 is when you start to think about okay what's near the, my full value what do i want to peel off we're nowhere near that yet it's not to say this can't roll over and cause more pain first but you play the odds you play the probability so uh that that was one that really stuck out and then um intel morgan stanley analyst joseph moore came out after the earnings sees the data center business recovering in the second half as supply constraints are resolved and review and views the guidance as conservative and that's exactly what what the ceo was doing um uh you know trying to under promise and over deliver 
He stated that even with multiple headwinds in the business, we viewed second half numbers as conservative. We don't see many catalysts and we don't fully buy into the foundry strategy as it stands today, but we do believe that the company can turn put a turnaround into place without earnings falling below the 450 level. We, we remain overweight and their price target is set, their 12, 12 month price target is $70 over at Morgan Stanley. The Intel chief says more consolidated, okay. So that was that. Then Boeing, Morgan Stanley came out uh, with uh, reiterating their overweight at 274 on Boeing. Boeing really flushed out on uh, Monday. Uh, and we talked about that as an opportunity on, um, I think, Bloomberg or Cheddar. So that's, that's playing out. That's had a nice bounce this week. Uh, this article, we've covered most of it. We did Dinah Washington's uh, What a Difference a Day Makes when everyone was pessimistic on Monday. And we pointed to this advanced decline issues indicator as another extremes. This got even below negative 2368 intraday. I don't know why it only printed down to this at the end of day, but I, I couldn't believe it. It was literally off the charts below negative 3000. And that's what I was like, this is extreme. And if you look under the surface, you'll see what's going on. Uh, we've covered all of the media. This is the Delta thing, by the way. This is when the CDC diagnosed Delta. You know, it's interesting. The amount of panic that I felt from the population and like TV and everything when we were at 250,000 cases a day, because I remember we went down to Florida for um, a swim meet in I think it was December when cases were like 240,000 a day and like I think like all the a lot of the cases were in Florida I don't feel like people were nearly as panicked as they are today with cases at 15,000 or 30,000 a day um, they've come down 90 percent now that you know the, the the fear is that they're going in the wrong direction and I completely understand that but you got 70 percent of the population with uh, nearly 70% with at least one vaccination, then you probably have another 10% that have antibodies. So you're talking about 20%. This is probably the final wave. We're nearing herd immunity. And the last 5 or 10% we need to get vaccinated. As soon as they approve it, those people are going to go. And this is going to be in the rearview mirror. And I think the market is obviously pricing that in. And if you look at from when they found the Delta variant, in March, the CDC diagnosed it. Deaths are down 75% per day and cases are down 50% today, even in the face of um, this recent rise. So obviously keep an eye on it, but um, I don't remember the level of fear in the market in December when we were at 250,000 cases a day relative to uh, what we're seeing now. So I, I think people just want this to be behind them and it's completely understandable. It's been so long. Uh, but it, I think we're it, it's going to be behind us and uh, sooner or later. And by the way, you know, a lot of people are very almost, it seems like, angry at people who aren't vaccinated. Um, and I think there's probably a few percent of those people who have immuno issues or health issues where they legitimately can't and you have to feel bad for them. But for those who are vaccinated, uh, that, you know, they're protected. And the people who don't want to be vaccinated, they're just taking a gamble that um you know either they're not going to get it or it's not going to be bad but what i think everyone needs to know is the antibodies for herd immunity are going to be there sooner or later so what people are trying to do is say don't get the antibodies the hard way because it might kill you get it the easy way because it's just you know a couple jabs uh and that's very very reasonable but as far as if there's fear that the unvaccinated people are going to cause COVID to go on forever, I, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think this last 20% are either going to get vaccinated or going to uh, get anti antibodies either symptomatically or asymptomatically. And, um, and, and the virus is just going to run out of hosts in the U S and then the key will be how quickly does, you know, the rest of the world get up to 70%, uh, you know, uh, vaccinations or MRNA vaccinations, uh, so that you know global travel can really pick up and and the game can be on so that so that 's that um, as far as the this national association of active investment managers this dropped to the low seventies so that some fear came in this week and now the market 's up again so we 'll probably see that bounce up again next week. Our message for the week um, uh, we mentioned a few new long term picks Intel and Boeing are longer term holds we added at the margins to energy. 
Nothing's changed in our outlook on defensive staples, utilities, and big pharma. This, the next few months, is the time of the year you're generally going to be rewarded for holding these groups. As for BABA, there's nothing more to add beyond what I covered in the three segments this week. <laughs> Quote, I like the stock, as Roaring Kitty said. So, um... So that's that. And, and, you know, more bad news. But it acted relatively well. It was the strongest acting Chinese stock today in the face of what was really horrible news. So uh, hopefully we don't have to play this down to a, an apex of the wedge. Hopefully we 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 found that flush uh, before July 8th. And, and this is just kind of shaking out the last week's sisters until we start to build a base and, and catapult higher. So, um, we'll, we'll see how those those meetings go next week. And then um, quickly, we'll just get through the last few things here. There was unusual activity in BABA. Someone was out buying January 2023, 285 calls for 2,200 contracts. Las Vegas Sands, someone bought 35,000 of the May 22, 6250 calls. I think that's going to be a good trade, by the way, the Las Vegas Sands. Um, Those are going to recover the Melcos. Uh, Again, it's all just this noise has to clear out. And, uh, oh, this is interesting about earnings. Uh, not only has earnings and guidance been great, and we'll talk about the beat rate in a second, but the margins, which was the name of the game, they've retained margins, with the exception of Intel guiding down in the short term because of these exogenous events. Um, on balance for all of the S&P, margins have held up, which is really good to see. Why did that happen? Because during COVID, they figured out how to, how to do more with less, and utilize technology and everything else. And then any of the raw material price increases are getting passed through as we anticipated. You saw um, Kimberly Clark report today, they were down like 5% pre-market, they closed positive because all of these uh, input costs are getting passed through to the customers and people are figuring it out. Um, Okay, so we got an 88% beat rate On the bottom line, 86% beat rate on the top line. If you remember, they were anticipating 63% earnings growth. I said it's probably going to be 70% or greater. Well, now it's 74% with only 24% of the S&P 500 uh, reporting. And the other good news is they took up earnings yet again in a relatively big way, a buck on 2022 and a buck on 2021. So now we're at 214.38 from 213 and change last week. So guidance keeps going up. We're going to hit that 220 handle, I think, before earnings season is out and probably 225 before year end, which makes the market look a lot more reasonable. So so those are the good things. This shows you the trend. Um, you know, it basically starts to look like 2020 never happened. And that's a good thing. And I'm sure many people would be happy to hear that. So that's that. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but, you know, just some of the highlights, obviously, J&J. All the health cares are coming. The defensives are crushing it. Novartis beat on the top and bottom line. Um, you know, Coca-Cola crushed it. AT&T and Verizon even did well. Um, let's see. Uh, Whirlpool did well. Honeywell crushed it. So you're just seeing across the board good earnings. And then as far as the economic data, housing starts, beat expectations, permits were down, but I think we're going to see those come up. Um, uh, Continuing claims, again, this was a problem. I think, you know, this gives Powell cover to stay in the market and focus on his employment goal, full employment first, ahead of inflation. Um, Initial jobless claims jumped up as well, so we'll keep our eye on that. Existing home sales were a little bit below estimates. Manufacturing PMI was strong. Service is a little bit weak. So again, we just keep our eye on that. Rig count was up modestly, but that, you know, that makes sense with, uh, with oil having had that run. We'll watch it in coming weeks. So that's it. I really wanted to hit the elephant in the room head on. Hope uh, many of you found that helpful. Uh, again, always opinion, not advice, but, um, you know, I try to walk you through these things uh, through the easy times are always fun. And, uh, you know, when you when you come into these periods like we had with Wells Fargo last year, it, it's always darkest before dawn and uh, try to separate the noise from the facts and, um, and and lay it out as best I can. So anyway, hope you enjoyed. Uh, have a great week. We'll be back next week. In the meantime, have a great weekend and make it a great week. Take care for now.